Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 noon, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Welcome to our second program in our anniversary briefing series to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. A big thank you to President and CEO Jennifer Romanecki for inspiring this series to explore and share the history and legacy of Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. Our first program in the series was the Selby Family's Love of Boating. And if you missed it, you can find that program on the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens YouTube channel. Now, our next program in April, on April 24th at noon, is going to be entitled um, The uh, Greenhouses or the Glass Houses of Selby Gardens, the History, the Present, and the Future. And that one's going to be a combination of myself and our Vice President for Botanical Horticulture, Angel Lara. So you'll want to look for that one. But today, we have an exciting program with our Vice President for Botany, Bruce Holtz, who's going to share with us 50 years of collecting, because that's what Selby Gardens has been doing for 50 years. Bruce has been here for 29 of those years, which is amazing. And he's going to share his personal experience, some historical background. And if you have questions along the way, please put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat. And as we, uh, as Bruce wraps up his presentation, we'll open it up for the questions and answers, but you can put them in the chat anytime during the program. All right, Bruce, it's all about you. 50 years of botanical collecting right here at Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. Thank you, John. You make me seem so old. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting that when John kind of approached me about doing this, um, I thought, well, you know, I can do that in my sleep. You know, I've done a lot of talks about that, but you know, when you really look at the at the incredible detail and and all the different things that we do, besides just collecting, so collect collections are really important for our institution. They really are, are landmark objects and uh, of course the beautiful things that we are able to display but um there's a lot more that goes into just having collections so um i'm going to try to to touch on some of that and um you know so we're gonna we're gonna step back a little bit because we're not the first people to be out there collecting um it's been going on for a very very long time so i, I put in um botanical collecting and other sundry activities because there's a like i said there's a lot revolving around uh, the collection and the activities. Forward. Here we go. Anyway, plants are pretty cool, right? Um, they give us uh, a lot of good stuff, food, fiber, fuel, oxygen. And one thing that I, a lot of people don't really acknowledge when they're kind of giving homage uh, to, to plants is the beauty. I think that's really a very important thing and, and, and something that we can see and appreciate here at Selby Gardens and, and other gardens. <clears throat> so that's what really has sparked the, the exploration beginning really with the dawn of mankind, trying to just feed and clothe themselves and then uh, begin to look for medicines and, and other sorts of uh, useful things. What really drove a lot of the, the travel and collecting uh, fever was uh, spices and, and finding herbs, medicinal herbs for use. And um, <clears throat> so that that went on for for several centuries. Actually, it still goes on today. There are a lot of uh, entities that are out there looking for new medicines and um, finding them as well. So plants still have a lot of uh, mysteries for us to to discover. Um, the New World was particularly interesting uh, because of the number of food crops that are found there. And um, I, I would have loved to have been to have been in Europe around that time when they're starting to bring things back over, uh, like pineapple. You can you imagine tasting pineapple for the first time or chocolate? Just You can just look through that list there and see some of the plants uh, that were collected and brought back over, potatoes and tobacco being particularly important as well. So then really with the Victorian age, um, science became a more important aspect of, of botanical work. Science and conquest, I would say. Um, a lot of the explorers were paid by the governments uh, to kind of uh, help demarcate lands. But while doing so, they, they were able to do a lot of collecting. This is a period of extreme 
uh, discovery and uh, thousands and thousands of, of plants were collected, many of them undescribed for science. So you have these really famous people like uh, Ruiz and Pavon, uh, uh, Alexander um, uh, uh, von Humboldt, Richard and Robert Schomburg, and uh, Richard Spruce. And I just, I love the, the painting of the gentleman explorers, uh, von Humboldt and Aimé Bonpland. Um, anybody that does field work knows that this is really a hilarious photograph or picture to look at uh, with uh, dinner jackets. Um, I can show you a lot of pictures of people in the field and you'll never see anything like this. Look at that table. Um, probably have some cigars in there somewhere. Beautiful, heavy stuff to carry around in the forest. This is back in 1800, where they crossed over from the, the Rio Negro in Brazil and found the, the water connection to the Orinoco River. So air travel was another really big advance in, in, um, in collecting and, and reaching areas that were difficult, um, and especially helicopters to get up to some of the most difficult and remote areas. Um, there, there were a number of institutions, many of them based here in the United States, um, such as American Museum, Field Museum, Harvard, Missouri, New York, Smithsonian, um, and, and they would send out teams uh, widely to, co to collect both, uh, both plants and also animals, depending on what their focus was. Um, and that was another age of, of great discovery. Uh, many, many new species discovered for science, new genera, new families. Uh, must have been a very exciting time in the early 1900s to go on a, on a trip by boat up the Rio Oh, any of the any of the rivers in South America to to explore. So, and then uh, a little bit later, 1973, along comes Marie Selby and the Botanical Gardens. Um, the, the mission, the current mission, is, it's changed over time, but basically, it's it says this, the same thing that we we work to um, uh, to study air plants or epiphytes, uh, native nature, and and now our, our regional history as well. So that's an important part of uh, the historic Spanish Point connection. So um, I just uh, just want to take a step back and and just mention the epiphytes. I mean, I I think this audience is probably pretty pretty familiar with with what uh, epiphytes are, but they're they're basically plants that live upon other plants, such as the ones that you see here. But they're also found in many different plant families in the world. There are about over there are over eighty different plant families where epiphytes have evolved and and thrive. Um, but the ones that we are really interested in and that we have a great representation in our collections are, are these that you see here: the bromeliads, orchids, gisneriads, and and pteridophytes or and lycophytes. So, uh, you know, epiphytes do a really great job of living out of the soil because they have these great adaptations such as succulents. In the case of bromeliads, they're covered with these really interesting uh, minute scales or trichomes that are able to absorb moisture and nutri nutrients, uh, not exactly from the air, but uh, from, uh, from the environment, let's say. And they've also um, evolved to cohabit and, and utilize um, many different animals, such as this uh, this orchid on the right uh, that has a hollow chamber where ants dwell and help protect the plant and provide nutrients to the plant as well. Uh, pollinators, uh, seed dispersers, uh, all play a very um, integral role in, in the whole ecosystem in the canopy. So we have, a, um, I would say, the guy who really brought Selby Gardens to life um, was Carl Luer. And he, it, was, it was he who uh, kind of envisioned what a garden should be, uh, patterned after some of the larger botanical gardens in the country, especially New York Botanical Garden and Missouri Botanical Garden, um, that had a full suite of activities. And uh, of course, Carl was well-known orchidologist at the time. And um, uh, so that was his, his first... Uh, his first challenge was to build up the orchid program. So they immediately in well, 1973, um, uh, Carl traveled to Ecuador and hired uh, Dr. Calloway Dodson, who had a, who has a research station down there. And um, so they began to, uh, to work immediately to build up that scientific collection. So they really began with 
almost nothing. Um, Marie was a gardener, but uh, she allowed certain trees to grow up like uh, Melaleuca and um, what are some of the other ones? So, oh, carrot woods and uh, plants like that, that um, um, nowadays we, we consider quite uh, quite a nuisance. Um, so they had to they had to really start from scratch to get get material. So you can kind of see what the what the barren landscape uh, looked like. And they were building these greenhouses. At the time, they were building the houses. They had absolutely nothing to put in them. So, so there was a great uh, effort by particularly both uh, both Cal and Carl uh, to travel extensively. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. But I, I remember. Um, well, that's actually actually Cal Dodson driving that tractor there. So uh, building this garden was was a very much of a uh, a passion um, by, by the by the people that started the uh, the gardens, the, the pioneers we call them, and uh, they it was really hands on. They were putting uh, bricks on the on the on the pavement. They were um, building rock walls. They were uh, pushing down. That's a eucalyptus, I think, that's being pushed down there, and then also. Uh, uh, raising money to support the gardens and and going on expeditions, so a very very busy time, um, and it, it shows up here in this graph of the total number of accessions added each year. Now, year one, you think, wow, that's that's a lot. That was a really busy year. Well, um, that was largely because of uh, uh, Cal brought some specimens with him uh, from the University of Miami, so that was the kind of the the genesis of, of the the collection. Um, and this this graph is of herbarium specimens, but th that really mirrors the the number of living plants that we have as well, because almost every expedition would would bring back both types of uh, material um, and also spirit collections. So you see the couple of first first humps there, and that's from like seventy seven to maybe eighty three, eighty four, and that was the period of the, of the greatest uh, exploration effort that's been undertaken here you can see uh for the rest of the time you don't you don't find anything that that equals that that amount of um effort and um a couple of other little bumps along the way there but um so i, I think that's a interesting way to, to 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 envision that now uh carl um described about three thousand different species of orchids and uh, he just passed away a few years ago as, as did cal dodson but um, at, at the time, he, he was the, the most prolific botanist uh, alive. And I think probably for the past 200 years, nobody has come close to describing that many species for science. And, and he, you know, this was not his first profession. So uh, he worked uh, tireless and many hours uh, describing, illustrating and publishing um, uh, this just tremendous body of knowledge of, of orchids, plurithalid orchids especially. And Cal Dodson um, also worked on orchids, but he he had a broader interest in in the floras and the floristics of different areas. So he um, he worked um, at his at his science center, the Rio Palenque Science Center, and um, also in the um, another area nearby called Jauneche. And and he and Al Gentry and, and other colleagues published the first. Um, mini floras. So a flora is a is a treatise of all the plants of a certain area, and in the past those had been been done mostly on a continental or, or countrywide scale, which take forever to 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 get published. It takes decades and decades. Um, and and so what they did was they 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 uh, honed in on a very couple of small areas, and they published a very uh, comprehensive account of those. And so they're they're kind of um, turn florula, but just for, for a smaller area. Uh, but they're very extremely useful. Anybody working in Ecuador, this was this was a gold mine to have these to have these works done, very well illustrated, and um, um, available through our through our journal Selbiana. Um, and then and then Cal was interested also in just epiphytes in general, not not just orchids, but. Um, he and Al Gentry published a, a landmark study called Diversity and Biogeography of Neotropical Vascular Epiphytes. It's probably one of the most cited uh, pieces of literature that's out there. Now, Cal, uh, being a professor at the University of Miami, um, he had a couple of students that he brought along with him in those early days. That was Hans Wieler, 
uh, who studied Gesneriads and Kiev Tan, an orchid specialist as well. Um, and then Mike Madison um, was just recently graduated from, from Harvard and along with a couple of other very well-known students at the time. And he was here probably for three or four years um, and, and conducting a lot of expeditions to some of the most, re most remote areas of Ecuador, discovering a lot of new species as well. His specialty was the genus Anthurium. And we have we still have his, all of these collections here with us today, very well curated and uh, very useful. We, they're, they're loaned out a lot and people come to study them. Um, Kiat went on to work um, in returned to Singapore, where he was from, and founded uh, Gardens by the Bay, and also served as the executive director of the Singapore Botanic Garden. So he's had a very long and distinguished uh, career there. Hans left uh, Selby, I think, in the early or late '70s, uh, to to begin his own foundation, uh, the Gesneria Research Foundation, and that was just located down the street on on uh, on Oak on Oak Street. And he had a rainforest there, uh, but he continued to collect. And he had a group of volunteers that would go with him and help fund the expeditions. Uh, so, so material, Gisneria material continued to come into Selby Gardens for, for quite a while. So we have uh, kind of a little bit of a turnover. Um, while those guys were still here, um, a few new people came along that also played a, a huge role in, in the collection of plants, especially the New World Tropics. And foremost among those is Libby Bessie, seen here in the middle. Uh, she she was a, a volunteer that uh, became the plant record keeper and also uh, managed the, the herbarium collection all, all um, while serving as a volunteer. She was also on the board of trustees. And so she played a really important role. Um, we still visit with her. As a matter of fact, John and I, um, did an interview with her not too long ago that we hope to to share out at some point, um, and uh, so she's she's just a wonderful person and um, has one of the most famous orchids in the world named for her Phragmopidium bessie, and then Joe Halton was also uh, a very uh, close colleague of Libby's and and they would travel often together uh, to to Ecuador and Panama and, and other countries to do to make collections so. Um, I kind of keep track of all the the expeditions that that happen through through Selby Gardens, mostly from staff, but also through some um, research associates. But so I think uh, yeah, in 1980 we're up to about 30 expeditions, and these are pretty major expeditions as well. These weren't just a week off or you know day day ride across the state. Uh, these were took a lot of planning and a lot of preparation and a lot of effort to um, to undertake. There's Joe on the left and Libby. That's Cal Dodson on the lower right. Uh, that's at that's at the Rio Palenque Science Center where he's do, doing some photography there. Um, so th there were, um, you know, everybody has a favorite kind of family of plants. I like bromeliads, uh, but when we go out, we collect as many different types of plants as we can that we think would be important for horticultural display, for conservation purposes. So we have a pretty good collection here that you, you don't often see of heliconias and calatheas, um, uh, peperomias and begonias, uh, many of which are epiphytic. So um, a lot of the plants that they collected back, th back then, 70s and 80s, are still alive. And um, we take very good care of them. Well, the greenhouse staff is really in charge of, of doing that. But um, those are really special plants for us because they're extremely difficult to replace if they're lost. So in mid 80s, early 80s, um, we had a new kind of group of, of people come in. Um, principal among them was Harry Luther, a bromeliad specialist. Um, he he had a photographic memory, so he could, um, you know, he could recall things, and he he learned the bromeliads. He was just fascinated with with bromeliads, described many new species. He did quite a bit of field work, not quite as much as uh, some of the others, but um, uh, he. Uh, um, eventually, he moved to Singapore to work with Kia Tan there, where he passed away. And um, and then uh, Ron Dieterman, who's in the middle, um, was here as an intern in the early 80s. He traveled to Suriname on our behalf 
and I think a few other countries as well. And uh, he eventually ended up at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, where he um, uh, served as the greenhouse, kind of the chief uh, greenhouse uh, curator, um, but also worked a lot in, on conservation projects there. So he still uh, still comes to visit us, and uh, he's on our uh, one of our advisory uh, panels for phase two of the operations of the garden's master plan. And then the young guy that you see down at the bottom, that's Steve Dahlstrom, um, who's uh, uh, began here as a, as a research associate. He was self, self taught in orchids, uh, but he's really made a career uh, out of illustrating them and collecting them and lecturing about them. He travels widely around the world, um, still resides here in Sarasota. So we see him often and um, um, let's see who else. Yeah, so you can see the number of expeditions was uh, was on the rise at, at this point, 100 expeditions by end of 1985. So we also had other associates that played pretty major roles. And these are some names that maybe some of you would recognize. Very famous botanists in their own right, uh, but also collectors who, who um, were very friendly uh, to us. And they would collect material to bring back and share with Hans or with Cal or Carl. Um, David Benzing among them, and Greg Brown, uh, both on our on our research associate staff. Um, Al Gentry and Tim Plowman uh, have passed away. Helen Kennedy is still working on, on Calathea, Miran Tastee. And um, Bob, Bob passed away just recently, Bob Dressler. He was one of the other legends of the orchid world. So then um, mid 80s to, to uh, 1990 or so, um, Dodson, Lure, and Bessie left the gardens, and probably by 1983 they had, they had left. And uh, but uh, so two new bot botanists were hired right out of graduate school: John Atwood, orchid specialist, um, and John. Uh, John was here when I started, and um, he then he, he retired and went back to Vermont, where he uh, specialized in, in organ repair and. Um, but we still keep in touch. And uh, he published a lot. He was a very prolific author and collector. He collected and uh, published on the floras of, uh, of Central America, largely. And then uh, John Cress was uh, the director of the research department for a couple of years. And then he moved on uh, to join the Smithsonian, where he spent the rest of his career. And then so Harry was uh, Harry Luther. Um, and Stig Dahlstrom continued to collect a lot. So, so this is also a very productive type time with 117 expeditions being logged by, by the 90s. So there were a series of research directors um, that shifted some of the attention of the garden and the, the department to uh, ecological pursuits, I would say, mostly canopy ecology. And so that, uh, that was not a productive time for collections, but certainly for research in understanding how epiphytes, you know, uh, survive in, in the wild and, and some of the other uh, factors relating to epiphyte ecology. Um, but uh, Luther, Atwood, Dahlstrom kept, kept on plugging along. And then um, the first paid position in the, uh, in the herbarium really with the collections was uh, Steve Ingram. This is a the more recent picture of him. I, can't, I couldn't find anything from when he was here back in the um, 80s. Um, 90s, excuse me. And then Raul Rivero, a, a Venezuelan botanist, uh, was hired here as the education director, but he he loved going into the field. I, I remember meeting him in, in Venezuela many, many years ago, and uh, he was he was collecting ferns. That was his, his favorite group. Um, and then there's a, uh, but when he, when he went out to do work and collecting, he would always in, in, involve a lot of an education component. Uh, the, there was a series of articles that he helped to write, published in Spanish, and and uh, in Venezuela, um, and there's a picture of uh, Nalini Nadkarni, who's um, who was also director of the research department for a few years. So then, here we go, getting modern here. Um, so I came on uh, the staff in late 1994, uh, Wes Higgins in 2000. And uh, Stieg, who had been a research associate for, for many, many years, um, finally, we had some money in the budget and we hired him. And I'll never forget, he, he did one of those Irish skips. He jumped up and clicked his heels and it was really kind of funny. He was so excited to, to come and work for us and paid 
paid position. And then, um, yeah, so Wes Higgins also uh, worked here for, I, I guess, close to a decade. Um, and he was another one of the orchid specialists, uh, specializing on encyclias and prosthecias and things like that. Um, and then when 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 West left, uh, we hired um, Toscano de Brito. He was on staff here for about uh, eight years, uh, working on pleurothalids. He was a very close collaborator of Carl Lures. Um, they they called themselves um, I don't know they had nicknames for each other. It's really kind of cute, uh, but they they published a lot and they collected a lot. Uh, Toscano especially uh, was active in, in Brazil where he was from originally. Oh, that, that's, that's me, and that's like 19, 1900 and, I don't know, 90-something, 90 97, uh, where we were flying uh, with the British Army uh, by helicopter up to a, a remote peak in, in Belize. It's fun. So we're really racking up the number of expeditions here, up to 200, and we used that number for a very long time, 200, 200. And it seemed like it was getting kind of worn, <laughs> uh, worn out. So I went back in and I, I looked at, you know, in the logs and make sure we had everything covered and we were counting uh, properly. And uh, we weren't exactly, but uh, we we're, you know, getting close. Um, but in the, in the subsequent um, uh, years, since 2005, we have done uh, quite a number of expeditions. And we've amplified uh, dramatically our work here in Florida, which I'll talk about in a minute. So our current staff, here's the Motley crew, sorry. Um, uh, Liz Gandy, been here for eight years. She began as a volunteer in the herbarium and then went on to a career with the, with the state and then came back to us. And uh, Tatiana Arias, two and a half years. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about her work in a minute. And uh, uh, John always looks a little ratty because he's been out in the cloud forest <laughs> uh, but he always has a area next to his face pretty much um, and then uh, Sean McCourt um, started off here in the horticulture department and uh, we then hired him uh, over into the botany department where he oversees the plant records he works very closely of course with the horticulture department uh, to maintain the records and and do the uh, inventories uh, of the living collection um, but he also helps out with some other uh, conservation projects in Florida, I'll mention in a minute. And then why? So uh, looking at the numbers a little bit more carefully and kind of, uh, I think we're up actually up to about 270 or so, what we call, we don't call everything like a day trip out that doesn't count for an expedition. So, um, but uh, probably 250, 270, what we would consider a major effort at, at doing field work, either here in Florida or or internationally. So these are the these are the sites that uh, we've actually done collecting in. So this is boots on the ground. Um, this is um, you see by far the majority are, are in Central and South America, and um, everybody knows why. That's where the epiphyte diversity occurs. Uh, but we've had a few people stray and and head over to Asia. One in Africa, I, oh, I, yeah, that was a research associate that was collecting there for us. Um, got some Hawaii there too. And so now you can see Toscano's effort there in the lower right of South America, all the, all those Brazilian things are uh, trips were mostly uh, by him. So then, so that's, uh, those are, like I say, boots on the ground, but um, we also collaborate extensively with institutions around the world to exchange plants either by either by gifting them if we want a name in return or or uh, just pure exchange where we, we give them five and they give us five back um but you can see the the tremendous number of, of institutions so i think the uh yeah so the yellow are herbarium specimens and the red dots are live plant exchange and you can see how that really amplifies our our impact on the botanical world um and when you put them together it's just Pretty, pretty impressive for an institution our age. Um, and we're, you know, really well known uh, around the world for, for this for this focus that we have on epiphytic plants and for our, our nearly peerless collections of living and preserved plants. So these graphs show you um, how, you know, how things have 
changed over the years. This, these are cumulative numbers. Um, and you see the herbarium, which is um, on the top and the live accessions down on the bottom, uh, pretty much mirror each other. I mentioned this earlier that, um, you know, you go out, you're going to collect, if you can, collect living plants. And if you if you can, collect herbarium specimens. So um, I see, you know, for the for the live accessions, that that curve is, is kind of tapering off a little bit. Um, who thinks we need new greenhouses? I think that's a good, uh, that's a good um, example of what we can do. I think if we, you know, with phase two, uh, that, that curve will, will be, be ascending again. Um, also, so we have the new herbarium as well that uh, has plenty of, of space for future growth. So just some numbers. So, you know, we have 183 different plant families here. Uh, that's nearly one third of all plant families in the world. Pretty impressive. 1,155 genera and 4,300 uh, different species of plants. Now that's, uh, uh, those, are, those are species, not individual pots. So, um, and then in the preserve collection, we have uh, 35,000. Um, that's, that's our current number. We think we have actually quite a bit more than that, but uh, we're still working on uh, barcoding and, and inventory and those things. And 120,000 herbarium specimens and the library. Um, I'll show you some pictures of, of these new spaces in just a minute here. But um, we are inundated with photography, which is great because pictures are so important for our work and especially those of our, of our own living collection and plants in the wild. So Everybody on our team that goes out takes the camera, um, hopefully, and um, that we have some excellent photographers on, on our staff, as well as on our volunteer corps. So a kind of a joke, uh, we say, well, if, if you press them, we'll guess them. It's a bad joke, I guess. Um, nobody's laughing. So, um, and everybody's uh, publishing as well. We, we're, we have our own journal, Selbiana. Uh, it was on hiatus for, for a while, but that's coming back out now. Um, we're, we work with other institutions to publish in, in different journals, um, po popular and scientific articles. Well, a really important uh, part of what we're doing, and I have to thank you know, Tatiana and, and John uh, for this, is uh, we're building up more formal collaborations with other, other institutions. I think that's really uh, uh, important. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's essential uh, for places like the, the University of uh, Antioquia or University of uh, uh, Columbia. Um, they need that signed document before they can ship us any any specimen. So if we want to actually, um, you know, collect there or have uh, have an exchange program with those institutions, we absolutely have to have a letter of agreement. So those are those are building up. We have some with Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, and New College, although they don't collect very much. Um, so I, I asked the horticulture department to get me a, a, a recent photograph of their teams, and um, I did get one from Angel. That's a very recent photograph, I think, this morning. Uh, but the whole team, I don't, I think they're camera shy. It's got to be. Um, so, so I found this one picture is probably from, I don't know. One of you guys knows Mike, but Mike would know. Angel's there. Um, and Harry Luther's there. Um, so yeah, I encourage them to get out there and take some pictures for the for their for the records. But uh I I want to call them out, um, recognize them for, for the effort. You know, it, it's a lot of fun, it's it's hard work, but uh, bringing plants back to Selby Gardens for, for all the purposes that we use them for. Um really relies on the horticulture department to to take care of them and to propagate them, uh, share them with other institutions. And um, so we we really appreciate the work that that team does. Those two teams do. So just to just to show you kind of the breadth of the areas where we've been traveling in the past, I don't know, six or so years. Um, uh, you know, Belize, Brazil, Colombia, Dominica, that's not Dominican Republic, and Ecuador, Peru. And as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of work. This is just a, uh, a short list of all the localities in Florida that we've been going. 
and these are usually one or two day trips sometimes and uh, but they're they're they tend to be more for conservation purposes although we do um, opportunistic collecting when we can and so that also helps us build up our, our Florida collection is growing rapidly because of the result because of this work that we're doing so just uh just to show a few pictures of uh, some of the work in the field these are the places that we went to in Belize over that period of time, 2015, 2019, uh, 40 different localities. Um, and we collected thousands and thousands of, of specimens for, for our herbarium and for, for the national herbarium in Belize. And um, um, really very productive. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's, a, it's challenging physically. Um, first time I'd ever repelled down a, a 300 foot hole. Um, you look at the mud on the tire of that tractor and uh, that's that sinkhole or cenote to the left is uh, just just amazing with my artifacts scattered all around all around the place. Really interesting place to work. And John, he was in the Peace Corps in in Ecuador. And um, he so he kind of kind of grew up there. He's been working there a lot. Um, he's he's gone back numerous times. He's done very, very extensive explorations, largely looking for Gisneriads, but um, he collects a lot of different kinds of plants. And um, he also takes a lot of uh, uh, students whenever he can, takes students into the field. In January, he took, um, I don't know, maybe 10 or so new college students down. And when he was at the Lawrenceville School, he would take take the, the students there, high school students, um, on different trips, Cuba and, and Ecuador and other places. And so uh, he really bridges the gap well between uh, the, the scientific aspect of Gisneria, it's pollination biology, uh, systematics and things like that, and then encouraging the next generation, helping to train uh, students on how to, how to, how to love Gisneria. That's, that's what he does. And he just got back uh, a couple of days ago. He and Angel were in Ecuador uh, for about three weeks uh, doing some collecting attending a, a workshop there as well. So um, that, that's such a recent trip. I don't have any pictures from that. You guys need to load some up for me. And then Tatiana um, uh, is from Colombia and has been here for two and a half years, as I mentioned. And um, one of her signature projects has really gained a lot of attention internationally, and it's called Orchids for Peace, or Orquídeas para la Paz. And it's a very innovative program to to work with uh, local villagers, um, ex-combatants from military conflicts of the past, to teach them how to uh, propagate orchids, uh, how to uh, perhaps uh, for for conservation or augmentation purposes, or for um, potential uh, for sale for uh, local income for the for the for the people of those areas. So this is this is deep into the uh, Colombian Amazon. So it takes takes a lot of effort and a lot of planning to get in there and then and and do this work and have the supplies that that she needs. Um, but she's built up a very good um, uh, number of collaborators who also are uh, they have nurseries that are scattered around so that they can grow because it's hard to get living orchids out of Colombia to bring to to Florida. But if they're propagated, it it makes it easier for for permitting. So um, I think there are, there are a couple of different nurseries at different elevations, so that could be a, a very a potential source uh, for us in the new new cool house, the new phase two cool house. I'm hoping. So you can, uh, I think both both Tatiana and John have a lot of uh, social media presence. So just look them up, and you'll see Instagram and whatnot. I don't know if they do TikTok. So here, closer to home. Um, uh, uh, Liz and I, in particular, have been working with the Lemur Conservation Foundation, and it's been been a very productive uh, collaboration with them. So we helped them identify the plants. Um, we did a full inventory there a couple of years back, and we keep getting invited back to help out with different research projects that they have. Uh, currently, they're looking at the, the the feeding habits of the lemur, especially the one in the upper right, the red rough lemur. Um, so we go down there and uh, work with Eric, uh, who's their main scientist, and um, just put names on plants. That's um, 
It's like you press them, we guess them. Uh, but it's a lot of fun to, and, and it's, uh, it's the property that they have there is, is very rich as well. It's maintained very well. They, they keep uh, exotics out and they burn occasionally. Um, and so, so the flora is very rich and, and highly it's because it's such an isolated uh, piece of, of good quality scrub. Um, you find uh, endangered species that are, that are thriving and, and, uh, you know, st still can be found there. So you've got uh, this beautiful sedge down here on the lower right, Rincospora megaplumosa. Um, and um, uh, there's an oak that's pretty rare in this area. So it's a lot of fun. It's been just a, um, a joy for us and, and um, very beneficial to, to the people that work at the lemur preserve to understand and know what, what plants are endangered and what plants might pose a threat to the lemur's health. So this, um, uh, Sean and, and a former uh, staff member, now research associate, Sally Chambers, have been working for a few years uh, to um, uh, propagate and study um, the Aboriginal prickly apple cactus. It's, uh, it's one of the most rare species on earth, um, probably just hundreds left and very few populations remaining. The last two in uh, Manatee County and, and Sarasota County um, I, I believe uh, are now extirpated. That is that the, they no, no longer are found there. So you just have these a handful of, of populations down uh, a little bit further south than us. Um, so um, we were we've been able to collect fruit and propagate them. You see down on the lower right, that's what one of the seedlings looks like. That could easily come from another galaxy. Um, so, so that's been successful, and, and it's been funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, they're very grateful for the work that we've been doing, um, and they provide uh, adequate uh, funding for all the field work that goes on and, and to cover some of the salary of the staff as well. So that's a great collaboration. And also working with the Center for Plant Conservation, um, and uh, they have a program called the Florida Plant Rescue, FLIPR for short. And um, that's an effort by by us and other other institutions around the state to identify what we what we know to be rare, but maybe it hasn't made it onto some of the lists of endangered endangered species. So uh, we've targeted uh, four or five of these things over the past couple of years, and we go out and uh, uh, collect seed, and those are then banked. In the case of the Asimina Minnesota, seed didn't work for us. We only got three seed one year. And um, cuttings don't work for us. So we are partnered with the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden uh, to who, ha who have a, a cryopreservation operation. But before they can cryopreserve, they need to get the plants growing solidly in, in, col in tissue culture. So that's what you see there uh, in the middle. Are, uh, we were just so excited when we got this picture because we, we had no success in propagating this thing. And now um, they're, they're doing Pretty good. We're, we're going to go out uh, actually next week to, to collect some more tissue for them. So here's uh, one of our species. Uh, look at the size of that seed, one millimeter. Wow, that took some sharp eyes. Um, and this is out in uh, Archibald Biological Station, really an interesting place. Mostly scrub habitat, but then you have these, these uh, depression marshes where the, where the hypericum grows in abundance. So it's it's not rare in in the that area, but it's it's um it's endemic to Florida and rare in, in, in general terms across the state. So in order to do all this work, we have to we have to seek help. Uh, I mentioned the collaborations already. And um we also have uh you know kind of an official um research associates that we invite to join us. Um, these are not these are not paid positions, but they're people that uh, have similar interests uh, as us, and um, some of them have been uh, associated with us for a very long time. David Benzing, for example, probably he's been associated longer than I have with Selby Gardens, and uh, Larry Skog as well, who was John's uh, uh, supervisor for his PhD, and then um, uh, John's student Laura Clavijo. So we have a good uh, good group of Gisneria people, but Elton Leme, who's from Brazil, a very well-known bromeliad specialist. 
Um, and uh, so I can't, oh, there, yeah, Sally, Sally Chambers is there. And William Sinea, one of our newest research associates from Haiti, um, is there also. So there are another five or so, but I, I just picked out a couple. Also, um, something that we, we really enjoy uh, doing is having interns here. And they, they bring a new energy to the place and, um, and they're learning. Uh, and most of these are at the PhD level. Some, some are not, but um, uh, you just look at the, the geographical representation here. It's pretty amazing from, from Belize to the USA and to, to Brazil. So we hope to do more of this and uh, our, with, our, with our new spaces here, we have a little bit extra room to, to host people. So um, the, the other group of people that's incredibly important are our volunteers. And uh, these are just such dedicated people. Um, I hope that some of you are out there listening to this, um, but I, I love these photographs. Look how happy everybody is doing this work. And, and we literally pay them in peanuts. So um, thank you to all the volunteers for your wonderful work and helping us to, uh, to make a difference here. So this is just a quick summary of what, you know, uh, encapsulate kind of what we do. Um, you know, when you walk around the garden, you have to realize, especially in the, the conservatory and other uh, places with uh, potted plants or mounted plants, a lot of these were collected during research expeditions. So that really helps to, to diversify and, and enrich our uh, visitor experience. Um, and we do these inventories um, locally and internationally. They're really important in helping to map a species on, on Earth. Um, and um, we also we provide our botanical expertise that anybody that asks, almost. Um, and of course, we, we I mentioned the publications. Um, and the work in Florida, we, it, it's our backyard, so we got to get out there and, and, and help with the conservation of these, of these fantastic plants. And of course, uh, our, we work uh, in, with the education side of things as well, hopefully even more so in the future. So here's uh, Calvin and Hobbes, and you know, the teacher didn't like his project, uh, thought leaves from an alien planet, and she said the whole thing was, she made, he made a mockery of the assignment. She'll be sorry when the aliens send her to the plutonium mines. She just won't admit it was a pointless project. Who cares about leaves? What useless knowledge? Oh, I believe that's uh, poison sumac you're holding. So a botanist would have recognized that right away. Galvin, not so quickly. A little botanical humor there. Um, so uh, John asked me to talk about the future of collecting and in, in, in our in our efforts here. Well, the future is now. We we're I'm sitting in the future. This is this is really exciting. Um, and I have I have some pictures that I took just yesterday, but these are some of the graphics to show you. If you haven't been here, uh, come on down. So this is this is like I said just yesterday, and I'm sitting kind of at midway through that building on the second floor. Um, and uh, this is the the new library. This is what it actually looks like right now. Um, we're still months away from finalizing our move. We still have material offsite that we're, uh, we're trying to get everything organized first. And then the Carlisle uh, Lure Spirit Laboratory. So this is uh, as I mentioned the second largest in the world with between 35 and uh, some other number. I'm not quite sure yet. And then we have the, the Mirab uh, Herbarium and Laboratory. So these are these are wonderful, beautiful, bright new spaces for us to work and and spread out in, and um, it's it's a very exciting time for us in the in the botany department. I can tell you. So we're going to continue um, continue the sort of work that we have been doing. I don't we don't see any real reason to change. Of course, new technologies come along; we have to adopt them. Um, but really, the area of focus being the American tropics is is really critical because of the conservation issues that the the plants there face deforestation climate change um but one thing we we know I, I mentioned the collaboration but the future is really digital and and more collaborative than it has been so we have a we have a series of uh, uh, volunteer photographers 
Um, and um, we're, we're imaging the living collection. We're imaging herbarium specimens um, using a couple of different types of technologies. Um, and if you if you want to see some of the uh, the volunteer photography results, pick up a copy of Orchid. It's for sale in the gift shop, and it just has stunning uh, photographs taken by uh, five, I think, of, of our of our volunteers. Just phenomenal work. And then, um, so digital being uh, everything's going into one main database called Brahms. Um, and it does, Brahms will do some fantastic things, mapping being one of them. So here's all of Carl Luer's collections in the new world um, mapped out to with very great degree of accuracy. Um, here's one plant that's growing right along South Palm. And you'll see the images down on the lower left. So we're linking in images. And uh, our goal is to um, is to have all this data be, be made public um, uh, within a year or so. Here's all of our collections from Venezuela. I was surprised when I saw that. It's, it's a lot more extensive than I than I thought we had. And um, right now we're putting material out to the public via a couple of different portals. One is CERNEC. You can see there we have 58,686 um, specimen records there. Those are herbarium images. And you can go in there and, and zoom them up to great degree of detail. And also uh, JSTOR global, global Plants is another one that we that we provided content to. Well, um, I want to thank everybody who, who joined in. Um, I appreciate the time, and I hope you learned a little bit more about uh, what we do here in the botany department. And again, thanks to our, our volunteers and, and the staff and, and the board and the, the whole gardens for, for the incredible support of our work. Thank you. Well, Bruce, that was a fantastic presentation. I very much appreciated how you covered it from the very beginning days of Marie Selby Botanical Gardens and, and the need to uh, bring plants that we could simply display to uh, all the science that you're using and the technology that you're using to document the plants that have been collected over the 50 years. Uh, truly amazing. And I would have to think that even for you and your staff that are deep into it every day, uh, when you reflect back on it like this, it really helps to, uh, I think, make everyone feel proud of those uh, botanical accomplishments. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, one, one person wanted to know if there was ever any opportunity for members or interested parties to join you on an expedition, on a plant collecting expedition. Well, um, you'll have to first go through some rigorous testing. <laughs> Uh, we we have taken some volunteers, um, but uh, uh, on on some of those trips, um, it's it's pretty rough. And so, what we do, and, and John, this is this is true. We we take them out into Florida for a day or two, um, test them out, make sure that they're able to withstand the the temperatures, the the water, waist deep water, or uh, not afraid of the alligators and things like that. Um, so so there are some possibilities. Um, but uh, we have to be, you know, careful. We don't want to. I, I almost lost a board member down there once in Belize. Uh -huh. That was close. We got, yeah. Um, but we haven't really lost lost anybody. So, well, in Florida, of course, is a fascinating place for botany. And if we weren't located in Florida, you'd have to do expeditions to Florida, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no one should really think of expeditions in Florida as anything less than they are in other parts of the globe because we have so much amazing plant diversity here. And I'm glad you covered some of that today. Um, we have um, kind of some comment questions. Uh, someone who's obviously a volunteer here was curious about where are all these orchids that we talk about having collected. And so uh, they're presuming that they're a mix between um, the display greenhouse, the conservatory, the working greenhouses, as well as the grounds themselves. But uh, what else could you share about that, Bruce? Yeah, they're, um, you know, one of the numbers that we we use is um, for, for the, in the conservatory, we can only exhibit, I, I'd say one to two, Two or three percent of our of our research collection at any one time, um, more so when uh, or, or or fewer when there's a when there's an exhibit, um, a few more when there's not. Uh, but many of them just uh, stay behind the scenes all the time. 
Um, some of those orchids that we're collecting also end up in the herbarium or, or in spirit, spirit uh, material. Um, we are really excited about phase two of the master plan because that's going to uh, give us more and better growing conditions where we can invite the more of the public back into some of those areas that are just not safe to go right now. So um, I think that's uh, that's something that we all need to, to pull together and support is getting phase two uh, funded and, and designed and constructed. And that's going to really help us enrich our collection and enrich the visitor experience. That's great. Um, Bruce, what do the locals, when you're down in Belize or you're in Colombia or Ecuador, what do the local populations think of, of these botanists coming to collect these very specific plants? Crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> no, it, you know, it depends. Um, uh, there's, there's always interest. Um, a lot of people, you know, love nature and, and, uh, uh, are familiar with the plants that grow in their areas. Uh, so, um, and some just, you know, people who live in the city, they they really don't have much of an opinion. But uh, we work um, with, you know, university professors. We work with forestry departments. We work with um, everybody that, that that has an interest, um, and and then we can collaborate with. So we never go down to a country just on our own and and you know collect plants. That just that that stopped happening quite a while ago. And especially here at Selby Gardens, we always seek collaboration sure sure someone uh you use the term cryo preserve and someone's curious about that yeah so um because the simon of minnesota doesn't the seed uh the seeds don't store well let's put it that way they'll last for a couple of days basically um so they can't be treated and put into dry storage um and uh we we knew of this um, botanist at the at Cincinnati Zoo who had been doing this work on a related species in South Florida. Um, and and she was successful at propagating it and then uh, storing the the propagules in 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 liquid nitrogen, basically. and And so then they can be removed in some future date and and propagated again. So that's that's a and that's an extreme way to approach plant conservation, but, in this case, it's it's our only option. And Bruce, back to the collecting, um, is there a particular moment or a particular expedition that um, sticks in your mind and is something that you would like to share with us? Well, I think we'll have to do another talk, John. <laughs> okay. um, there's there are a lot. Well, I've heard a lot about rappelling down into the cenote. So yeah, that must sure. have been no, that, uh, quite fun. the uh, experience. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I, I love flying in helicopters. So and being in high places. So that that's always fun. And and Bruce, if you could uh, organize and plan an expedition to anywhere in the world, uh, where would it be? Wow. Um, well, I, I would say the... Uh, uh, Upper Amazon in in those in those uh, countries that that ring the uh, major Amazon basin. So that's uh, the Yungas Forest, which is a which is the kind of moist mid elevation forest that ranging from Bolivia to the Colombia and Venezuela. So any any anywhere in that area um, is really interesting. Because I'd like right. uh, I'd like to work in Venezuela a lot, but we're not able to go back there at this time. So I think a number of our viewers today are volunteers and they appreciate all the information, Bruce. It just helps them to educate our guests and members who come. And so people have said, hey, they really like your list of everything that Botany does and they like the numbers and they like hearing these stories about um, how throughout our entire history, we have been collecting plants, identifying plants, and then uh, doing our best to display and exhibit and share those plants with the rest of the world, which I think is you know, this huge part of the legacy of Marie Selby Botanical Garden. So um, I think that, um, I think we've covered all of the questions um, that we have today. And so Bruce, again, I'd like to thank you for sharing this with us. And it's a perfect setup for our next anniversary briefing, which again is going to be April 24th with Angel Lara. And Angel's going to explain to us 
how he and the team take care of all the living collections. And so uh, that's going to be another great program that we'll do uh, virtually so that everyone can participate. We'd like to thank our audience uh, who was here with us today. Please tell your friends. Uh, you'll be able to find this um, on, on our YouTube channel for Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. And that way, if someone that you know uh, is busy volunteering right now and couldn't watch it, well, they can watch it later and appreciate it. And Bruce, thanks again so much for sharing this with us and for what you and the team do uh, and all the partners, as you say, because it's about collaboration, technology, um, and science and uh, doing what we can from our little headquarters here in downtown Sarasota to really improve um, the nature throughout the whole world. And, and that's just fantastic. So thanks again, Bruce. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, John.